So we will uh, quickly move to the next uh, lecture by Professor Irene Baldriga. You may have already known uh, Irene because she gave a wonderful lecture on Renaissance art in 2021. I really thoroughly enjoyed I hope you enjoyed it uh, as much as I did. And today the topic will be different. So she is going to actually talk about Michelangelo's Moses, which is the important statue that is just behind the, the screen to your right. So Irene, it's a pleasure to have you back in Nodicon. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, again at this great and very impressive event, I have to say. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm going to, um, well, my task today is to introduce you a little bit to one of the great masterpieces of Renaissance art, so something different from what you normally uh, study and practice, but certainly uh, something which you will certainly enjoy. And, uh, well, uh, where are we now? Uh, the church, the Basilica of San Pietro in Vincoli, where we are, is really a sort of a shrine of Italian Renaissance. Uh, today, obviously, we will simply talk about uh, uh, the uh, one of the masterpieces which are preserved within this incredible church. But it is important to know that this church is one of the most ancient in Rome, and it is extremely linked to the history of early Christian Rome. So close also to the archaeological, uh, the most important, important archaeological sites of, uh, um, of the town. So we'll talk about the tomb of Julius II and especially the Moses. And I will explain you why I have chosen such uh, an unusual title. I'm going to, to talk about the concept of a terrible beauty. And I, I have chosen this strange word, uh, a little bit unusual when you're talking about beauty and art, but I would like to um, tell you why uh, such a beauty can be actually uh, considered as terrible. Um, so, uh, behind this beautiful screen, there is the very masterpiece. So, obviously, I am inviting you to look at the original one after uh, this, uh, this conference. And uh, uh, a, uh, certainly one of the most famous masterpieces by Michelangelo. Uh, generally, uh, uh, many people know uh, about the Moses, but not so much about uh, how it was created and why. Uh, it is a part of a tomb. Uh, which is behind the screen and which was dedicated to the Pope Julius II. Uh, first of all, it's a very strange story, this one of the Moses, uh, so much linked to the very life of Michelangelo himself as a man and as an artist. Uh, actually, the tomb was commissioned to Michelangelo in 1505. Julius II had been elected in 1503. He was very alive, uh, very powerful, very ambitious, and he thought to call the most uh, talented artist of the time, Michelangelo. He called him from Florence uh, in the moment of his most uh, popularity, of this great popularity. So he had Michelangelo uh, in Rome, and he asked it to him to project uh, this tomb. Uh, first thing which you can see and which will certainly notice is that at the very center of the tomb uh, um, we, we see the Moses, not the Pope, which is a little bit unusual. Generally speaking, when you look at a tomb, well, the dead is uh, obviously the most prominent figure. So uh, generally the, the tomb, of course, is focused on the figure of the dead. But in this case, we see the Pope here. Sorry, I have also a pointer. Uh, well, but maybe it's too far, no, too far. So, but you see the figure of the Pope is on the top. It is the lying figure which you see there. Uh, and he is a, a little bit asleep, not really a dead, because this iconography, which is typical of the late 1400, represented the, the dead body as if it was asleep. Okay, so it's a, it's a sort of a soft passage from life to death. Uh, but actually from to the eternal life. And at the center we see the, uh, obviously, we see uh, the Moses. So first question is why? Um, 
we said that uh, the tomb was commissioned in 1505, but uh, uh, um, when the Pope decided to call uh, Michelangelo to Rome, well, it was at the very uh, apex, we can see, of his uh, power. Uh, uh, he was uh, uh, a very, very ambitious pope. Julius II is the pope responsible for the very famous apartments painted by Raphael in the Vatican palaces. He also commissioned the rebuilding of the Basilica of St. Peter. Imagine, he had the old early Christian church destroyed in order to build a new one. So imagine how much he could be ambitious and powerful. And you see here represented in two very famous images by Raphael. On one side you have the famous portrait by Julius II which is preserved in London National Gallery. He seems so pious, so uh, such a quiet man, an old man. And on the other side, you see the real Julius II. He is again um, painted by Raphael in the Vatican palaces. Yes, he is praying, but you can feel uh, the uh, energy he had. Imagine that when Michelangelo was asked by Julius II to create a bronze statue of him in Bologna, um, he asked to the Pope, uh, well, uh, would you like to be represented with a, a book? And he replied, he answered, no, not, not a book, a, a sword. I would rather be represented with a sword because he, he liked to be uh, represented and described as a warrior, okay? So imagine how tough should he be. Uh, at that time, obviously, Popes were obviously the heads of the spiritual power, but also of a very political and even a military power. And Julius II embodied perfectly this idea of the Italian Renaissance. Well, here you see uh, the uh, Pope Julius II in the tomb, uh, which we have here in San Pietro in Vincoli. And here you can see why in the David he decided to call Michelangelo uh, in Rome. Uh, in 1504 Michelangelo had um, completed the David, the famous David which is in Florence, and thanks to this monumental, incredible masterpiece, he got an incredible popularity. As I said, he really was the most talented artist of the time, certainly famous also for his ability to challenge the perfection of art and the perfection of nature, so great, so talented, to be better than the ancient artists, better than the beauty and perfection of art. That's why Julius II wanted the best one for his tomb. But uh, when Michelangelo arrived in Rome in 1505, this project, uh, well, uh, started to take a form, a shape. And the first design of this tomb was incredibly uh, monumental. You see here uh, some drawings which, which mm, tries to, to, to give an image of the original project by Michelangelo, a pyramidal structure so big, which should uh, mm, imply about 50 stages, 47 uh, around we have counted, and uh, uh, on the very top of course there should be the figure of the, of, the, of the Pope, then the figures of Moses and Saint Paul, and then all around the basement there should be figures of slaves, captives, which probably represented provinces, territories which had been reconquered by the Pope, the warrior Pope, or maybe images of the arts which were also tamed and conquered by the Pope himself, the Pope, the patron, because this was also a very important aspect of his uh, figure, of his uh, uh, power. And here we can see some of the surviving images, uh, the, the statues which were created by Michelangelo. He was mad for this project. Uh, imagine for a very ambitious artist like he was, having the possibility to create the most monumental tomb ever created, which could compete with the great, great masterpieces of ancient art. He was thinking of, imagine, the great mausolea of the Hellenistic world. So it was really the great, great opportunity to become the most famous artist ever. 
well, in the end, he became, of course, but he didn't know at that time. So uh, he, he, these uh, images, which, you, which I am showing to you, are the images of the slaves which were created. They are not completed, as, as you know. They are preserved in Florence. If you go to Florence and look at the, the David, do not uh, ignore, please, the images of the slaves, which are all along the corridor, which brings you to the David. So these figures are incredibly powerful. Look at these images of these human bodies which are really struggling. They are fighting against stone. It's incredible the tension which they are able to, uh, to show and to represent. They were meant to be posed all around the basement of the tomb. And here you have the two other very famous surviving statues, which are in Paris at the Louvre, the famous dying slave and the, and the rebellious slaves. In all these images, you see the human body fighting, this idea of attention, of the power which is inside the human body. Okay? It's muscles, but it's also a sort of a spiritual fight, the desire to get out and we will see why it is so important for Michelangelo. So, I want to tell you now why I have chosen this title, The Terrible Beauty. What is it, this terrible beauty? Well, the most important biographer of Michelangelo, Giorgio Vasari, who wrote a book like this, a uh, very big book about the stories, uh, the narratives of all the greatest artists and architects and sculptures since the Middle Ages to the Renaissance time. It was published, well, the second edition, which is the most important one to us, 1568, okay? Vasari uh, really was convinced that Michelangelo was the greatest artist ever. And he uses very, very often this term, this expression, terribilità. Uh, I want to say it in Italian because it sounds differently. Terribilità. Terribilità means uh, the ability of causing fear. It is so terrible to scare, okay, to scare you. So imagine something which is so beautiful, so monumental, so, so great, that you are scared. Why are we scared? Why are we helpless in front of such a beauty? Because maybe we feel we are such human beings. We are such mortal, mere uh, human beings. While that work of art, that masterpiece, that landscape, that natural phenomenon, the idea of terribilità can be applied to a number of, of things, obviously. Well, they are eternal some way, or anyway, they are great. They are universal. So that's why terribilità is a term so often used by Vasari in order to describe Michelangelo. Terribilità, he was terrible in the sense of being incredibly talented. He was terrible because he was incredibly gifted, quite supernatural in the sense of being able to create universal masterpieces. And certainly the Moses has exactly the kind of an artwork like the David, which uh, inspire this idea of a terrible beauty, a terrible beauty. Um, uh, look at the gaze of this man, look at the power of his body. Let's look at him a little bit. He is seated, okay? He is the great leader of the Jews. He is the biblical hero who led the Jews to freedom. And also, he was the man who had the opportunity to talk to God. He spoke with God. He received the, 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 the tables of the laws, uh, the laws of the covenant from God, from the hands of God. And he had the word of God himself. So he really is a terrible man in the sense of being incredibly powerful, quite supernatural. He can talk to God. Imagine then how important it is to Michelangelo to represent this figure. And now you understand also why the Moses is at the very center of uh, this tomb, because in a way it was considered uh, as a sort of an alter ego of Jusil II, the warrior pope. He wanted to be represented as Moses. And this sort of a parallelism between the pope and Moses was very, very common at that time. 
okay? So even within the Sistine Chapel, you find this kind of uh, uh, comparison. But on the other side, Michelangelo was also, uh, some way, had a, also, uh, also a sort of a special feeling with this statue. Because we said it was commissioned in 1505. It was created, carved in 1513. And then it was located here in San Pietro in Vincoli after 30 years. So the statue arrived here only in 1542. So imagine this incredible statue, which was already, we can imagine, quite completed in 1513, staying within the workshop of Michelangelo for such a long time. So he became a sort of a beloved, and I think also a hated, fellow uh, of his life, of his physical uh, human life and of his uh, supernatural spiritual life as an artist. So he had a sort of a special relationship with this statue. And I think he, he was also the alter ego of Michelangelo himself. When the Pope died in 1513, the statue was quite completed, but the tomb would be created and completed and moved here in a very reduced uh, project because you see it is now just uh, uh, quote unquote just quote unquote a, uh, a wall tomb uh, so so different from the big pyramidal structure we have described uh, at the beginning um, but uh, uh, the statue was a sort of a, um, a reminding of the great project Michelangelo had thought of in the very beginning um, Okay, and so here it is. Look also at his, uh, 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 at his posture, okay? He is seated, but look at the tension uh, uh, the statue is able to express. You look at the foot which uh, pushes uh, back, and at the same time you like the hips which are lit, uh, slightly turned, and then you have the head which turns on a side, and the shoulders which on the contrary uh, move in the opposite direction. So there is a sort of a spiral tension of this figure, which seems to move within the architectural frame which contains it. It's incredibly powerful. There is this energy, this power, this incredible tension which expresses life. This statue is alive. That's why it's really a terrible beauty. It is behind us. And if you, uh, you should do that, when you will approach the statue, uh, you should try to move on one side and on the other, and you will have the impression that he is looking at you. What are you doing? So it's, it's really moving. Uh, it's following you. It's, he's asking to you something. So imagine, OK, probably you will, you will have to, to answer some way, to answer some way to this terrible beauty. Um, I also, yes, I show you also some, some sh details, uh, uh, little details, uh, the hand and the bird, the beard, which is so famous. Uh, look at the beard, which goes down. Even that seems to be alive, because it goes down with uh, incredible spiral curlings, uh, and it is uh, soft and at the same time uh, incredibly natural. So once again, a terrible beauty. And then the gaze, of course. Uh, here, Moses obviously is represented after he has received uh, the, the tables of the law. Uh, you can see them right there. Uh, he has them uh, uh, on his arm. Uh, they are quite slipping away because in this moment he's very angry. Uh, why he is uh, looking uh, with such uh, a tough gaze? Because he's probably looking at the uh, Israelites uh, who are uh, again worshipping the, the, the golden calf. So they are falling out again in it, idolatry, which was forbidden, of course. It was against the laws of God. So he's incredibly angry at this moment, okay? And that's why he has such a gaze. All at once, it seems to turn and to look on a side to understand what it is going on. And he, obviously, he's going to, to talk and to say something against uh, this uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, attitude. Um, the, the work is, in a way, the statue, a sort of a synthesis of the great art, 
uh, of Michelangelo. So looking at nature, but also looking at the antique uh, of the great masterpieces of ancient art. And we cannot think of, uh, we cannot ignore the importance of the Laocoon, one of the great masterpieces of ancient art, which had been discovered in Rome in 1506. Remember the dates? Uh, I, I'm not doing like I do with my students, but okay. 1505, the commission of the tomb. 1506, the discovering of the Laocoon. Everybody flocked literally to look at it. Such uh, a terrible beauty he could express. Once again, a terrible beauty. So these were the models on which Michelangelo were thinking on uh, the greatness of sculpture and the talent he wanted in some way to achieve. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, there is a point which is crucial to understand, generally speaking, the art of Michelangelo. There is a sense of uh, a uh, forced immobility in this statue. You see, it is seated, yes, but we said it seems to be alive. So it seems to be some way binded to the seat, as something is uh, um, uh, making it impossible to, uh, uh, to, uh, to move and to do what he would like to do. And this idea of immobility is very, very common, very typical in Michelangelo's art. We have seen it also in the slaves, in the captives. Remember, the human bodies fighting against marble. And it was very, very uh, um, inspired by the philosophical uh, uh, context that Michelangelo had received and had lived when he was very young at the court of Lorenzo il Magnifico in Florence, at the, at the end uh, of the 1400. And this philosophy was the Neoplatonic philosophy. So this idea, this concept that there are some perfect ideas which live some way in a sort of a heavenly dimension. So uh, earthly things are just the copies uh, of these perfect ideas. So the, the, the uh, uh, imagination of Michelangelo, the concept of art uh, according to Michelangelo was that the figure was some way hidden within marble. That's why he liked it so much to go to the quarries. He went to Tuscany and he, in Carrara, and he liked it to choose the, the piece of marbles. He wanted to choose them personally, as he had a sort of a personal relationship with stone, with the marble. He wanted to recognize the figure which was hidden, which was imprisoned within the stone. So the, the, the role of the artist was to get out the figure from the stone. And that's why they are binded, because they are, they are fighting, literally, to be freed, to be alive. And, uh, and I go to the conclusion, uh, obviously, this idea of having uh, figures so perfect in a way, but so, per so terrible because alive, because uh, also able to inspire this idea of perfection and this idea of connection between what is natural and what is uh, 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 linked to earth and what is spiritual, divine and eternal is exactly the theme which Michelangelo uh, uh, has uh, also developed in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, when uh, Pope Julius II called Michelangelo in Rome from Florence, uh, well, he had asked a tomb and Michelangelo was very happy. But after a while, Julius II said, I'm, I'm really alive, I'm really very strong, I'm not going to die right now, I do not need actually a tomb immediately. So why don't you paint the ceiling of my chapel, the Sistine Chapel? And he was mad for that, Michelangelo didn't want to do it, because he said, I am a sculptor, I, I am basically a sculptor, I want to do this great, great monument. And in the end, obviously, well, he accepted uh, this, uh, uh, this commission, and he painted the Sistine Chapel. But look, Look at the similarity okay, between the statue of Moses and these figures of the prophets, which are again fighting uh, against uh, uh, the material, in this case, 
paint and also the, the, the architecture, they are trying to get out and they are incredibly alive. There is obviously, we are exactly in the same years and Michelangelo is thinking exactly on the same topic. Uh, topic. Uh, we often say that Michelangelo painted as a sculptor. Uh, look, the most important aspect in Michelangelo is the human body. The human body. Humans are the heroes in Michelangelo's art. They are the heroes, okay? They are the real main characters of his art. Nature is rarely represented. You will not find landscapes as in Raphael, okay? You will find basically very sculptural and monumental figures. And this is exactly what happens in the Sistine Chapel, where these figures look so uh, close to what the Moses uh, looks, okay? So, well, uh, I've talked too much, <laughs> probably. I, I hope I, I have some way contributed uh, to make this day, this very special day, a little more special uh, with my very small and humble contribution. I invite you, of course, to meet uh, uh, Moses uh, uh, as soon as you can and the other masterpieces by Michelangelo uh, in Rome and elsewhere. And I thank you very much and I hope you will enjoy also a terrible event. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Irene. You actually, you, you made already our day. You, you really showed us what the search of beauty in art uh, means. So it, it, thank you, really. Thank you.